uh, many of us are friends for transparency. I worked with Mark and Anya at Storyful. Uh, Anya and I also sometimes share an apartment in New York. Uh, Greg and I were founding partners of First Draft. Uh, I shared a three-hour train ride with Alexios, and he's a good friend. So uh, it's a joy to be on this panel with people who I talk about this stuff all the time with uh, and to have a conversation with all of you about these topics. So we're going to talk a bit, and we're obviously going to have a Q&A because I'm sure lots of you have lots of things to say about it. The second reason why this is going to be the best panel ever on this topic um, is because it's a kind of a call to action. We've gone through four months of a moral panic this crisis mode where we're looking at these short-term solutions and thinking that if we all sit on panels, we're going to solve the problem. But we're sure as hell not going to. And the first thing we need to say is we need to stop using the term fake news. <laughs> to the point, can somebody hold up the bowl? <laughs> this is the fake news tip jar. I've already said it about four times. I've got another two. Thank you. It's also my personal Aperol Spritz fund. Uh, but we just need to stop saying it. So this is Google Trends um, from Korea. This is not just a Trump exercise. A big part of this uh, panel is to say, this is a global phenomenon. We need to stop thinking about this through just a simple Trump lens or a Macedonian teenager lens. This is much more significant. It's much more systematic. And I've just come back off a three-week trip to Asia where politicians around the globe are using the term in the same way as Trump is using it. And we need to stop doing it. People stop using the term global warming and change to climate change. We need to come up with that. Part of the reason for this panel is also we need to come up with that this new term. Um, we've got some ideas. We might share them a bit later. Um, so, uh, th yeah, this was recently in Korea, and I asked them to say, well, how are people, you know, thinking about this term? And they have terms globally for these things. So, um, to get back to this point, it's gone. I pitched this to Chris in October. We're not allowed to use it anymore. <laughs> and the thing I'd say to all of you is, and the reason that I think this panel is important is that we are all part of this problem. So this was a great keynote by Randall Rothenberg, who's the president of IAB, back in January. And he said, it's much more than a supply chain failure. It represents a moral failure as well, one that implicates marketers, agencies, publishers, platforms, and technology companies alike. So one thing I would say to all of you when you leave this room is what role are you going to play in fighting this global information pollution crisis. It either means that you start a group in your local community where you teach verification skills. It might mean that you work for a platform company and you give data so that we can research these issues. It might be that you're incredibly rich and you want to fund First Draft. <laughs> Whatever it is, I want you to leave this room and do it because we need to stop flipping just talking about it and wake up to the fact that this is a global crisis. This has been happening and building for years. One thing that Trump did was put a spotlight on it and made people open their checkbooks, but this actually has to be something that we need to think seriously about. So many of you may have seen this slide floating around, which is my attempt to say, if we're going to stop using the term, we need to understand the whole ecosystem. So Craig and I, you know, on First Draft, Craig did great job, a great job basically talking about News, which was this idea of 100% for-profit designed specifically to deceive. And he was talking about this for the last two years, did great work at the Tau Center, but then it's been co-opted. And so the point of this slide is to say we are all implicated in this. If we are writing clickbait headlines, that's part of the mess. If we're retweeting old coverage old photos, if we are actually calling out the wrong perpetrator of an attack, we are part of all of this. And if we don't recognize we're all part of it and keep blaming Macedonian teenagers, we're not going to get any further in terms of solving it. And so part of it is thinking of the different types, but part of it is thinking about the motivations. In Asia, the motivation isn't profit. The motivation is inflaming nationalistic divisions. It's about religious divisions. It's about freedom of speech, suppression. There's a whole host of reasons people are doing it. And if we don't understand the nuance and we don't understand the platforms, if you spend time in Asia and you understand the different messaging apps in all of the different countries and the fact that this isn't necessarily just about the Facebook news feed, it's about dark social. And how do we stop this if it's circulating in WhatsApp groups and Kakao Talk and Line and Viber? Then we're not going to get any further either. So... This is nuanced, it's complex, it's going to take us years to get out of this mess. The solution is not going to be glamorous, and it's not going to be quick, and it's not going to be solved with one big check. We need to dig down and... Rec All right, Alexios. Sorry, I'm very excited about this one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
um, this is my rallying cry. Uh, that it's going to take us time to dig out of it, but we have to realize the, the seriousness of this uh, before we can start solving it. So I've got an incredible panel, and I'm going to ask each of them to speak for about five minutes about their particular work that they're doing in this area. Then I'm going to throw out a few questions, and I'm going to throw it out to you. Um, but I'm going to start with Mark uh, Little, who I worked with back in my storyful days, who just wrote a great piece in Neiman Lab, if you have or Neiman Reports, about building a new trust economy. Um, so I'm going to ask Mark to talk a little bit about how far we've seen these things come in the last few years. Thank you, Claire. And listen, that's a great introduction. We may have approved a declaration out of this after all. Um, I think one of the things to say what this is and what this is not, and we've just taken the term and we've dumped it in the bin and that's great, but the second thing we need to do, I think, is say it's not just about truth or alternative facts. It's about trust as well. This is not, as we talk about the misinformation ecosystem, about the supply of misinformation. It's also about the demand for misinformation. And those two things are so important because it then leads you to put to bed another, I think, exaggeration which is that misinformation has always been with us. That is quite true. It's absolutely self-evident that back in the days when Gutenberg was inventing the print printing press, we thought this would be, or I'm sure he thought this would be, the opening of a democratic era of full information when in fact it became the, the prelude to the most violent period in human history. More information does not necessarily create trust. And I think what we've seen over the past 10 years, for me, is what makes this so different to what came before. What makes it different from the tipping points in the way TV and radio have been used for propaganda, for hate, I think back to the way that Hitler used television and radio to sow hate, the way radio was used back in Rwanda in the 90s to incite genocide. What's different now is the collapse of the means of production of news as we understand it. So the rise of social platforms when we start looking at the creation of Storyful was the transfer of the means of production of news from those who had printing presses and transmitters and satellite dishes to anybody who had a device and access to a social platform. And the means of distribution of news also were lost by journalists. There was a vacuum and a void, and what filled it, to a large extent, was misinformation. So we mentioned Storyful. The idea was a group of us got together and said, what would happen if we tried to fill the vacuum that has resulted from this historic shift in the means of production? What would happen if we tried to verify this user-generated content or eyewitness media and fight back against those who would use it against its democratic purpose? So we would see in the early days of the Arab Spring, for example, where we would see a video of a apparently Syrian soldier being buried alive, but in fact it was a propaganda hoax perpetrated by the Syrian regime to try and reflect badly on the rebels. How do we find out? we had open collaborative groups of fact checkers that came together uh, who, who basically could verify and in this case debunk. The problem what I've seen over the past 10 years is that the forces of good in this battle for clean information have been aped in some ways, mimicked, that the things that we used, the techniques and the processes, the social web itself, which is the best fact checking mechanism ever known to man, has been turned on its head. And now these dark forces hiding in plain sight are using the collaborative instincts of the social web to spread hate. Just look at the rise of the Twitter bots that are spreading misinformation and hashtags right now in the French elections and the presidential election in the US last year. So in many ways what we've seen is the search for truth, the battle against misinformation, the tools we were using in the early days, let's say, of the Arab Spring have now been weaponized and turned against us by these forces of darkness that are hiding in plain sight on the social web. And it has to be said, while we talk about Twitter, we talk about the messaging apps, we have had the rise of a news feed from Facebook that is in many ways about passive consumption. And I don't think that we can start this conversation or go through it today without pointing to the fact that I don't care if you call Facebook a technology company or a media company, it, I could care less. But this is probably the most dominant form of news distribution in history, given the amount of people that rely on Facebook for news. So we have to examine very closely the criteria. If we have this dominant news distribution system that does not have, as a core of its algorithm, truth or objectivity, that is a fundamental problem and that makes it different than what's come before. If it's just news spreading ambiently, programmed by an algorithm, then we have a problem of dimensions that have not been known before. Now I know the 
lots being done by Facebook, and we'll hear from Anya later on about this. The final thing I would say before I hand over is that this is all to do, as I said, with the supply of misinformation, but also the demand. We're living through a an implosion of trust, not just in journalism, but in the public institutions of our society, because people just don't believe anymore what they are reading. They have, I think, in many ways reacted to an information overload of historic proportions by just retreating back into what social psychologists call the heuristics, you know, those shortcuts that your brain uses when faced with misinformation or too little information sometimes, your confirmation biases, which means when we check facts, Sometimes, not only do people not believe us, but they believe us less the more we bludgeon them with the truth as we see it. So information overload is fry those neural circuits that we need to process information. And just as we need trusted sources of information, journalism is living on top of a business model that is bankrupt, that penalizes trusted sources of information by forcing us as journalists into a pipeline of information in which there is no distinction between the shit and the quality, that it's all priced for the same programmatic ad model. If you were to invent a model to erode trust in journalism, you could not invent a better model than that, the business model that we've been forced to live with over the past year. So I think one of the things I would leave you with, and this I think hopefully tallies with the rallying call we have, is that walk away from here. Don't just tick a box and say, yeah, I've, I've got my, uh, my fake news uh, filled. Sorry. <laughs> I've had my fill of that um, <laughs> particular topic. Everything you will hear over the next two or three days in some way comes back to this challenge of restoring trust in journalism. Whether you go to a panel on solution journalism or data journalism or any video panel, this is all about us as journalists finding ways to get back inside the heads of people whose brains are fried by misinformation and too much information. So this is something far broader than simply that moral panic that Claire talked about. And I, and I hope we see it through that perspective and that lens, uh, both an historic lens um, and also solutions that are about solving problems that we've never had before. Thank you. Excellent. Oh, clap mid-panel. <laughs> so Craig Silverman's got some slides. This first slide is the worst design slide ever, and it includes... It's very simple. It's a simple <laughs> slide. Um, okay, so it's just a simple slide. I don't know what she's dogging about it, you know. Also, get your two euros out. All right. Uh, well, I'm going to now not read my slides. Well, I wouldn't do that anyway, but I'm going to make sure I don't use the F word uh, or the FN word, I guess it is. Um, so I'm, I'm going to just focus a little bit on a few of the, the things that I've kind of learned over the last, uh, I don't know, six to eight months of really focusing in this area. I've been doing research in this area for about two and a half years, but uh, we put a big push on almost starting a year ago uh, to look at online misinformation. And, uh, and so I want to focus in on the area of stuff that is completely false and, as Claire said, done for an economic motive, which is sort of the definition I've been using for the word that I'm not allowed to use. Uh, and, uh, but I also, there's another piece tied to it, which I won't go into in a big sense, which is that there's the stuff that's totally false, and then there's um, this kind of world of hyper-partisan media, which I think is rising because of what Mark talked about, the decline in trust overall in institutions, and those are the two areas that I've um, had the most focus in. But, um, so in 2015, when I started kind of researching in this area and looking at rumors that were spreading online, I started building a list of sites that published completely false uh, stories that were made to look like news stories. Uh, I, that, that's when I first encountered them in 2015 and realized that they were doing this because they had ads on the sites. And so my list then was like 12 to 15. I have a list now, um, and, uh, and it's, it's like, so it's got, I work at BuzzFeed, so I have to make GIFs. Um, and so the list is actually higher than that, although I'm happy to say that the list I have is roughly about 130 sites now, but there's a significant portion of them that are either no longer online or no longer publishing new stuff, uh, even though they still kind of monetize their pages with ads uh, up there. So the problem has gotten a lot worse of these 100% false stories uh, and, uh, that are created to earn money. And this is an example of the kind of people that are doing it. These are two really nice teenagers in Canada uh, that I wrote about back in August who at the time were running three websites, and the three websites all basically did the same thing. They realized that 
they could get a huge amount of engagement on Facebook and elsewhere and earn a lot of traffic for their site if they combined two very popular things. The first was Justin Trudeau, our, our very handsome prime minister in Canada, uh, who has global See, If I had said the prime minister of Canada like three years ago before him, nobody would know who it was. Uh, it's a weird thing for Canadians. And then the second thing is weed. And so if you put Justin Trudeau and weed together in a totally false article, it's magic. Uh, and so they had started and they ran one website, it's no longer up, called hotglobalnews.com, which I think is just a wonderful name. Uh, and they expanded and launched two others where they just published completely false stuff and they sent me their Google AdSense, uh, their best month on Google AdSense was about $10,000 Canadian. They earned just writing these hoaxes. Uh, and the quote there is from one of them, they basically realized the thing that a lot of people have realized online is just tell people what they want to hear and you'll get away with it. Uh, and so it, for me, you know, a, a quick summary of, of the thing I'm not allowed to mention. For me, again, my definition is stuff that's 100% false, that people created knowing it was false and did so for an economic motive. And, and I use that term because to me, if you're, if you're doing false things or you're spreading stuff that's misleading and you're doing it for political or ideological motives, I think we have a good term which is propaganda for that. Um, and so this was a very specific species that I kind of encountered uh, roughly two and a half years ago of these websites uh, that were using completely false information to make money. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's the, the kind of definition I started using. They, this stuff exists, and it's great we're having this larger conversation because a bunch of things came together and people kind of put them together. So one is obviously um, uh, the, the low barrier to entry. So the first thing is it's very easy to launch a website, get a domain name, get it up there. Um, second thing is programmatic advertising. Brands don't know where their ads are showing up online for the most part. So once you disintermediate that, the content that gets attention and that has an audience, people will pay to get their ads on that even though they have no idea what the content is. Uh, and so that's been a big thing. Algorithmic filtering, as, as Mark mentioned, in, in the news feed where, you know, it's being, it's being selected for you based on your habits and what gets you to react. That's been a big thing because people sort of just feed you more, like the kids said, more of what you want to hear. And so a bunch of things that were happening online came together to create this opportunity for this kind of stuff. Um, my experience is that in a lot of cases uh, in, in North America, people are doing this as a side hustle. It's, it, there's only a handful that are making it their main business, but there are some larger networks we've found of like, the biggest was a guy whose day job was a pilot in California, but ran f over 40 F news sites on the side. I was almost said it there. I almost said it. Um, and so uh, tight. Just put some money in. Um, I'm, I, now, now it's like a challenge for me to not use it. And I've been saying it so much in the last eight months that it feels cleansing. And I cringe whenever I say it now as well. Um, and uh, and so, so what I also found is their strategy is usually they find Facebook groups where there's lots of people interested in the particular topic they've written the hoax about. And they put it in there because that's, that's kind of a, a, an established... Uh, group there. Uh, and so they're monetizing, obviously, with programmatic ads and other types. So that's just like the quick overview. Um, you know, we mentioned the Macedonian teens. We did this story in November. Uh, just, you know, so this is one example of it. And this is important because what happened is they realized that the audience in the U.S. was worth more money in terms of advertising than if they had done, you know, stuff at, aimed at a Macedonian audience or another audience. And so what we've seen is this kind of, um, you know, outsourcing of misinformation for an economic motive where people in countries, we find them in not only Macedonia, but Kosovo, Vietnam, and other countries, where a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars U.S. a month in advertising is game-changing for their lives. And so it's not just people creating this stuff in the country where they live. There's now an economic overseas model for misinformation. Uh, and that was, that's one of the big takeaways for me when we did the Macedonian story. Uh, and just so you know, it's, sorry. So it, obviously the election was, the big thing, we did an analysis to try and quantify how significant the spread was. Um, and this is not a perfect analysis, and I think in a lot of ways it's been misinterpreted. But we looked at the fake news site's biggest hits, because they live and die by viral hits, compared those to top 20 articles from mainstream, big mainstream news sites in the US. And we did find there was a big spike um, in overall engagement on Facebook for the top 20 false stories. Uh, and, and so I think, as Claire said, this kind of was the wake-up call, but it had been happening for a long time. Uh, and the Macedonians, just so you know, it has actually gotten worse. 
Uh, there's a site in the US run by a guy who's a liberal who says he's trying to show how, how gullible conservatives are, and he writes crazy hoaxes about like Obama about to be arrested. And th in this one example, 19 websites, mostly run out of Macedonia, copied it and pasted it within hours of it going up, and that spread to 19 different websites made to look like actual conservative US websites. Uh, and they've also gotten worse. This is a great example. So this is, um, you know, just a horribly written, uh, this is a completely false quote. So Clint Eastwood says, you, are, you all whom hate Trump and support to Obama are assholes. Are you agree with him? <laughs> it's very bad English. Uh, and I, I'm sorry for our interpreters having to, like, figure out the bad English into Italian. That was probably the worst thing that will happen to them at this festival. Uh, so this is a site. It's run out of Macedonia. They just make shit up like that. And, uh, and if you go to the page, it's not even a real poll. And if you click anywhere on the page, it takes you to an ad. So the market, they've actually just said, oh, we're just going to get worse. And we'll, you know, because they get paid if there's any clicks right away. So it's gotten worse in some ways. Um, and just the last thing that we looked at most recently was the types of ads on fake news sites. Oh, is that Thank it? You. I almost made it. <laughs> um, no, I got, I got. Yeah, man, I got. Oh, here, look, I'll put two in. No, yes. I'll put two in just so I'll get one in the bank for later. Uh, <laughs> so what we found is that there are a lot of uh, advertising networks have kicked them out, in particular AdSense, but they've moved to those related content ads. So we, find, we found over, over 60 F News sites that, were, that are still monetizing. Uh, and, and so like these are the types of ads you see, those types that you know, look like news headlines. And they often take you to fake-looking uh, news articles as well. Uh, so that's what the ecosystem kind of looks like for this purely fake stuff. Uh, and, uh, and you know, as I say, it's gotten worse in some ways. Uh, there has been some reaction. It's harder to monetize, but I actually think that means we'll see more overseas people doing this because the money you earn in the U.S. isn't as attractive. So I think we're going to see, frankly, more Macedonian teens doing it. Uh, some governments are cracking down. There's a law in Germany right now that will probably pass giving fines for information that's not taken down. Um, and, you know, it's never going to go away. It's a whack-a-mole problem, and people just exploit whatever platform, whether it's Facebook or anything else or AdSense, they just exploit it and figure out ways to do it, and it's kind of classic spam in that sense. So that's the quick kind of briefing on, on some of the stuff that I've been following. Thanks, Craig. Um, Alexios. Oh, more clapping. <laughs> Alexios, do you want to talk about what you've been doing since December, but more generally. Sure. Um, can you guys all hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Do you want to talk in Italian? Uh, no, I'll be all right. <laughs> I'll start by... Um, and that's me done, hopefully, for the next five minutes. Um, I still see some use in the term uh, fake news, um, uh, as defined by Craig, right? Um, uh, we, we may want to call it fabricated content, uh, but uh, stuff that is entirely made up, not for political reasons, for financial purposes, that rides and sails through algorithms and, uh, and our new online uh, distribution systems, is a thing. We need to call it something. Um, and because if we don't have clear definitions of what these things are, uh, we can't really address them. Um, and I would remind uh, everyone that, you know, before it was misused by Trump, a term fake news was misused. Uh, by journalists who were lumping in Breitbart and other hyper-partisan websites in there and making lists of quote-unquote fake news sites that weren't fake news sites. They were sites that uh, angsty liberal commentators couldn't uh, uh, really quite deal with, that they were getting as much traffic as their own site. Um, there are, of course, also other politicians, including the president of the chamber of our own, I am Italian, uh, Chamber of Deputies, who lumps in fake news and hate speech and trolling all in one big bundle, uh, as if we can address them all in one false week. So that's premise number one that I wanted to make. Uh, we can fix fabricated content, um, and we should, um, this, the, if we define it well. The second uh, premise I will make is that Facebook gets a lot of grief uh, around this space, uh, and I'm likely going to give it some more later, um, but I should uh, also make a premise, right? Um, the reason why we are talking about how big this phenomenon is, is that Facebook uh, is a place where we can measure it, right? We can, uh, Craig could do that uh, experiment and see how many engagements this, these things got. 
We couldn't do that before, or we couldn't do it as effectively before. If there was a buzz sumo for shitty uh, articles that uh, regular news uh, sites published over the past 20 years, I bet you engagement would be out of the roof. Um, so I made those two premises, and I feel better. Um, <laughs> now, I do want to talk a little bit about specifically what, what, what uh, the International Fact Checking Network is doing. That's the organization I had. And if a lot of you are blanking at what the hell the IFCN is, uh, don't be uh, sorry that you are joining a, a, a rich club that includes my father and the customs official um, <laughs> at every single airport in America that I go into. So we are an alliance of fact-checking organizations around the world. Um, I am based personally at the Pointer Institute in Florida. Um, and, you know, over the course of last year, uh, as with other analysts of this space, we realized that this was going to be a growing problem, not a new problem, uh, especially organizations in Brazil and the Philippines had seen this kind of stuff uh, be harmful long before. Um, but um, we, you know, we, we started mobilizing. We wrote an open letter in November. Um, in, on December 15th, uh, Facebook and Anya will touch upon this, no doubt, uh, ultimately did roll out um, a tool to uh, try and fight fake news um, on, uh, on the news feed. Uh, I'm going to walk through a little bit of how that works, because I don't know how many of you have seen it, considering that uh, it is not currently active in, in Italy. Um, so right now, uh, before we get to this, users can, at the top right, where you can flag or do different things to, to, to post that you see on your news feed, can flag a post as fake, or, you know, that looks fake, and it, if sufficient amount of uh, users and whatever algorithm magic Facebook adds to that um, uh, work, it will go up to a dashboard. That dashboard is uh, uh, accessible from uh, a group of uh, verified third-party fact-checkers. Uh, what does verified mean? Uh, those third-party fact-checkers have to have signed on to the code of principles that uh, our organization leads. You can find it online. It's all about transparency, essentially. Um, but it's quite a rigorous vetting process, I can say, um, having wasted a lot of hours on it. Um, there, there we go. Yeah, those are the five principles. So uh, it, it really is, does come down all to, um, to transparency. We ask uh, organizations to prove that they respect these principles and then have external assessors who are experts of journalism within the country where they are, the fact checkers operate, um, to, uh, to verify that. All right, so back to the verification process because I'm running out uh, to the Facebook process because I'm running out of time very quickly. Um, say at least two fact checkers have, dispute, have actually found that one of those links that a lot of users thought was fake was actually a fake news story. Uh, this will happen. When you try and go to share it uh, uh, as a status on, on your news feed, it says on the bottom, disputed by Snopes and Associated Press, which in this case are the two organizations who disputed it. Uh, when you go look a little bit further, it explains, uh, these are all, by the way, um, from a Quartz article, um, it, it, it indicates what disputed means and, and points back to the code of principles that I showed you a moment ago. Um, if you're, you know, persisting on wanting to post that, you can post it, um, but it's like, are you sure? Um, uh, and when you have posted it, uh, it comes up anyway with that warning sign uh, for your fellow friends um, to be aware of. So uh, it's been rolled out in the United States. Uh, it has been announced in French and, France and Germany, though it is not yet operational. Um, uh, I should note that uh, if you think the choice of France and Germany is casual, uh, you probably uh, don't know how uh, European laws are made. Um, I think I have, uh, uh, I want to close with a uh, um, few pros and a few cons of this tool and, uh, and my own rallying cry for the end. Um, I think this tool is, uh, is willingly cautious, right? It targets specifically fabricated content. It does not try to do all the range of other problems that there is on Newsfeed, and I think that's something that you can target. It's good because it uh, calls on at least two fact checkers to dispute something. Um, you know, in my perfect world, we'd have 11 fact checkers dispute these things, but you know, it requires time to actually do this. And the more organizations you need, the less quickly you can put this kind of tag online. Um, I think obviously this is where users are, right? I read something on Facebook. I didn't read something on, unfortunately, whatever media outlet you, it's actually from, so that's important. And I think, uh, and this segues neatly into the cons, 
um, this is something that can be studied, right? Facebook collects all kinds of data on how its users interact and react to information they consume. And so we can actually figure out whether this works, how this works, whether we should give up on it altogether, uh, and what comes next. Now, on the con side, I think we are, we haven't seen any of the data from the three months uh, of the pilot phase, and we desperately need to see it in order to know whether it works. Um, obviously, this is uh, for Facebook, and I hope Anya won't mind me saying, um, about 50% also a APR uh, process, right? Like this was, uh, Facebook was in a, in a maelstrom and had to react. I have no doubt that there are people, a lot of people, including Anya who comes from Storyful, who care about this problem. Uh, but there is also a company that looked like it was in a lot of trouble and was getting a lot of criticism and reacted to that. So there are two uh, imperatives in this strategy, and I'm concerned as to how they will play out in the long run. Um, and then the, the final problem I have actually is with journalists themselves. Um, I think there has been a lot of lemming journalism when it comes to what the tech companies are and aren't doing. Uh, shiny new object or shiny new tool, let's all run to it and say what it, what, what's happening and fall off the cliff. Um, we're not actually following up with this. Even that Quartz article that I showed that went step by step was three months into the process and claimed the process was new. I think there has not been, uh, there has either been the knee jerk, oh my God, Facebook bad, uh, or uh, oh my God, awesome new tool uh, kind of coverage, um, but not like the sort of analytical coverage that uh, led to, you know, and I'm not doing this for pleasantry, Craig really did put this uh, issue on the global scene, and he did it by actually digging and finding out who was behind and how these things work, and I don't think there's been any kind of journalism that's looking at this tool and seeing, does it work? Where can we find out more? Uh, how should it change? So uh, if you are a journalist in this space, please dig. Thank you so much. <laughs> So I'm just going to say, Anya, thank you for being on the panel. <laughs> You've been <laughs> poker face throughout. Uh, you didn't have to be on this panel, but you have been, so thank you. Um, but yeah, we'd love to hear a little bit more about some of the things that um, have been discussed. Great, and yeah, thank you for having me, Claire. She doesn't um, mean it. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Because um, I think many of us have been out on the conference circuit for months now. Many of our weekends have been taken up by, by discussing this. And, you know, in terms of how Claire has framed this this morning, I think all of us collectively, and hopefully for most of you in the room, we want to get to the solutions part. And the solutions, like Facebook, we have our responsibilities and our platform. But many of the solutions are also going to have to be collaborative across the industry. Um, like false news... There we go. Um, you know, there, it is so complex. That's a word that we've used a couple of times this morning. Um, and we're, we're going to have to be creative and innovative with our solutions. And to pick up on Mark's point about how we talk about Facebook, like, it's probably fair to say that when most of you think about a technology company or a media company, we're not that traditional definition. Uh, we're, we're a new platform. And with being a new platform comes new responsibilities. Um, we build technology, but we feel deep responsibility for how people use our platform. Because on Facebook, we want people to come there and have informed and engaged um, conversations. Like You go back to what the core mission of Facebook has, has been from day one, is to make the world a more open and connected place. And for those of you who may have seen um, Mark Zuckerberg's letter, community letter, some weeks back. Uh, one of the, the, the core things in there for me was this idea of creating informed communities. Uh, you can build an open and connected world, but what does it mean to build informed communities? And the news industry is critical to that uh, sense of, of creating uh, informed communities. And so we've been working on, on false news for a very long time now. It's something we take seriously. I would categorically say to all of you here this morning, we do not want false news on our platform. Uh, our community, our users, our public do not want to see it. Uh, it goes against that core mission that I've just talked about. False news runs counter to the mission of Facebook to make the world more open, connected, and build informed communities. So it has no place on our platform. And we have said, particularly uh, Adam Masseri, who you'll hear from on Fridays doing a keynote, um, he, back in December, said 
we take our responsibilities seriously, we will work on this until we get it right. And so, you know, what you've heard from Alexis in terms of that pilot and, and what Claire pulled up on, on the slides, we are learning, uh, we're iterating, we're working with the industry to really understand what's going to be meaningful and impactful in this area. Because as I say, false news, it hurts us as a platform. We don't want misleading content. We don't want content that is ultimately hurtful to what we're, we're trying to do day to day. So in terms of what that looks like, um, hopefully most of you saw in January that we announced the Facebook Journalism Project. Um, it has basically three core pillars. Uh, the first one is deeper collaboration around products with the news industry. Uh, the second one is training and tools for journalists. The third one is training and tools for users. And obviously, a lot of those pillars go to, to you know, big ideas around monetization and distribution and other things like that. But also, false news, misinformation, news literacy, polarization, sensationalism, all of these core things come back to that idea of creating informed communities and societies. So in terms of how we've been tackling false news misinformation in recent months, I guess it breaks down into kind of four areas, I would say. Um, what we have learned first and foremost is that a lot of false news is economically motivated. So what we've been working really hard to do is to disrupt um, those economic uh, ties between traffic on Facebook back to these ad farms and external websites. So we've been trying to kind of cut off those ties. And when something is flagged by uh, Alexis or AP or Snopes or ABC, so those third-party fact-checking organizations, when w w more than one of them have disputed something on Facebook as being worst of the worst, like false, hoax content, uh, once that has been disputed, you can no longer run that as an ad, you cannot promote it. So that's a key thing in terms of breaking those um, economic uh, financial incentivizations that are active. And the second thing is that we have been working to get early detection around these spoof domains. Um, so working really hard to identify uh, what are these spoof domains, websites that are bringing people out to these spammy websites. So there's a lot of work around those economic uh, uh, ties. Uh, the second thing is to build products that are going to address these issues. So Claire um, and Alexis have shown you some of the work that we've been doing around ensuring that the community, when they see something suspicious, something that just doesn't feel right, that is very simple to drop down and say, this doesn't look right to me, I want to report it to Facebook. So just that flagging, putting that in the hands of the community uh, in a very simple process. When that um, flag comes in from the community, um, there is a team of researchers, they're full-time employees in Facebook, who are then going to work to try and understand, is this potentially coming from a legitimate or a, a, a spoof domain, or is it a personal post? So first and foremost, they try to kind of separate out the personal posts. What they're looking at is just simply the domain, trying to understand is this a legitimate website or not. If they have determined simply by looking at the domain this isn't something that looks legitimate, it looks suspicious, they're then sending it over to the third party independent fact checking organisations who are then using, as, as Alexis uh, was showing you there, their principles and protocols, rigorous verification to understand is this something worse of the worst hoax, fake news content. If more than one of them decide this is hoax, this is false, a flag goes on it, and what uh, you will have seen there is that warning appears on it. Now, first and foremost, if it is disputed by the independent third-party fact-checking organizations, it can be downranked in newsfeed. But even if you did see it, you're going to see that warning, which is kind of just a, a, a call to people to pause for a moment, to say, this has been disputed by independent third-party fact-checking organizations. Just consider whether you really want to share this. So just that idea of, of informed sharing. Uh, so that's something we've been working really hard on. Um, the other area in terms of just products and, and iterating is around, we're looking at a lot at user behaviors. So when somebody clicks in and reads an article and don't share it, why is that? And really trying to understand is it because it was clickbait, you know, that they, it, 
the content didn't match the headline or there was something in there that was misleading. So we're all the time working to address clickbait on the platform and basically downranking it in feed. Um, the other thing, because we, we appreciate false news is part of a, a wider societal issue. One of the other things that we're looking at and trying to learn from is this whole idea of polarization. And you know, back to the Mark Zuckerberg letter of a few weeks ago, uh, he talked about trying to make sure you give people the complete picture. Now, I know when I say that to some of you this morning, you'll instantly think, well, surely it's enough to give people an alternative point of view. And what our research suggests is that when you just give one alternative piece, um, that will actually make people more entrenched in their originally held viewpoint. So one of the things that we're looking at, and we've been talking to the industry a lot all over the world in recent weeks around hackathons and roundtables and workshops is, is there something that we could do around offering up diverse perspectives? Not just one, but maybe you see a number of perspectives so you can see where does your opinion fall in, in that suite of, of ideas. So those are some of the things that we're grappling with. Thirdly, and I can go into this in more detail because I'm conscious my time has run out. Uh, the third thing is how do we help uh, users. So we've been doing a lot of work around the idea of news literacy and, and giving people through experts like First Draft and News Literacy Project and other. How can we empower our community, give them the skills, tools, information for them to be the arbiters of truth? So I can speak an awful lot more to that. Mm -hmm. And fourthly, is that, as I mentioned, we have work to do on our platform and we're learning all the time. We will keep going until we get this right. But we also want to work with the industry on a collaborative basis, and that's why this week we announced uh, the launch of the News Integrity Consortium with CUNY and about 25 other funders and participants that I'm happy to go into in more detail. So that's a quick overview. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. okay, so before we open it up to Q&A, um, I mean, I wish... Are there any social psychologists in the room? So I'm a researcher by training, I have a PhD in communication, and I do sometimes get frustrated around these debates that they're completely atheoretical. We have a lot of information about how people consume. What we don't necessarily have the body of research around is how it works on these new platforms, because academics sometimes take a little bit of a while to catch up. Um, but sometimes I just want to go to bed and put a pillow over my head and say, <laughs> All of this stuff, does it matter? Because as humans, our brains are fried. We are creatures with lazy brains. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to read something that's challenging. Like, is all of this for nothing because we're just not very nice people? Craig. <laughs> I, I mean, my no would be my first response. Uh, no, it's not all for nothing. But that is, that is the huge challenge is that we focus a lot on the technology aspect and the economic drivers. And at the core of it is that people are just attacking our innate human tendencies to you know, love information that confirms what we already believe and reject information that goes against it. And so it's a huge challenge. But the other thing that to me is interesting, and, and I don't know how long it's going to take for us to really understand the impact of this is that what's going on is, is we're all fundamentally consuming information in an extremely different way than was done you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And, uh, and one of the things that we've learned about brains, and I'm not the best person to talk about it, but is that over time you know, we adapt and we do evolve and we rewire to a certain extent. And so I think what's happening right now on that kind of um, you know, the brain and the, the psychological level is that we're getting information in ways that we've never really had to process it before. Huge amounts of it coming not from specific sources like a newspaper we choose to read, but coming in a mix in social feeds to us where we don't necessarily pay attention to the source, where it's not a show we've specifically chosen to watch, and we're not equipped to really handle that. Uh, and But I do think that over time, we can, we can adapt and we can kind of rewire to it. So uh, I do think that there is an opportunity in that sense. And then the other part is if people are manipulating us for the bad stuff, how do we ethically manipulate ourselves for the good stuff is the other side of it. Like you can use them in the, you can move that in the other direction. Um, and I actually, I had a conversation with a, uh, a Facebook a newsfeed engineer at a conference and Right now, the news feed, uh, the incentive that a lot of these scammers and spammers have is, is like they just watch what works and they go with it. 
And so what they realize is, you know, feeding people stuff that just goes into what they already think works. And so they go with that and they walk up right up the line until they get banned or punished by Facebook. And so what he talked about with me was how do we create incentives that rather than walking up to the, the bad line, they're actually rewarded by walking up to the good line and they create something that actually, you know, has, has quality and has value to it. I know that's difficult to define, but they, they also get rewarded with the shares and with the engagements. And, and I think that that's maybe one of the opportunities is figuring out how we you know, take these tendencies but move them towards the good thing without unethically manipulating people. And that for me is the challenge for journals in 2017, is how do we become that trusted voice in your head again because we've lost that position. Like Amer the average American consumes five times more information today than they did back in the 1980s. And as Nate Silver always says, you know, when this, you know, the capacity to process information is less uh, then the supply of that information, there is danger there from humanity. If you haven't read a great book by Michael Lewis quite recently uh, called The Undoing Project, he examines the rise of social psychology and explaining how people go back to these what we call heuristics. The shortcut which says, I'm going to believe the person that I already believe. I'm going to take recent examples, vivid examples. Um, I, you know, I'm going to find examples that conform to my previous expectation. These are all the shortcuts we're using in an age of information overload. So the problem for journalists and for the platforms is the system we have right now is making this worse, this sense of a lack of trust, because you know, essentially what's happening with the Facebook news feed is that friends and family are your gateway. It comes from them, so it feels intimate. It feels like a friend is saying something to you. And that is the core on the ethical solution. How do we make people feel that journalism has people's backs? It's not just about those shallow interests, your interest in music or politics or sports, but your vital interest as a parent, a commuter, a voter, a taxpayer. And it's how do we align journalism with those vital interests again? And how do the platforms, and believe me, I've worked for a platform, I've worked for Twitter, so I believe in the good intentions and the benevolence of the people who are there, particularly my very, very good friend, Anya. I see people here from Google, I see people here from Twitter. I think what their challenge will be is to turn trust into an engineering problem. Because nothing ever gets done in a platform unless it has a product team, a product manager, an OKR, a, a, you know, basically a KPI and all those acronyms. <laughs> nothing happens. So how do we turn this concept of trust into something that an engineer can work on and define as a metric of success? And journalists have got to get better. And Alexios' point is so well taken. I used to sit in Twitter, and I'd go into meetings with publishers, and I would do my head in listening to journalists lecturing the platforms. You know, they had a fundamental understanding of how you build really good innovation. And I think as journalists, we do have to face up to the inadequacy of our business model. We've got to work very closely and understand intimately the way the platforms work and how we can help the platforms turn trust in journalism into an engineering problem and hopefully then a solution to that information overload. So just to be really depressed again. Um, <laughs> so when you start mapping this stuff, and this is a piece, if you could put the slide up of, um, uh, I mean, there's, there's amazing stuff that comes out every week. I actually have a misinformation reading list. I've been on the road for a month. And I'm like, oh my God, there's 26 things I haven't added to the reading list. But this just came out, this new research from a, a professor in Seattle. And she's actually, she looks at when there's a mass shooting, the conspiracy theories that, that circulate really, really quickly. Um, and this is great work by Lawrence Alexander, who works at Bellingcat. Um, the image on the left is kind of a traditional Twitter ecosystem. On the right, we have bot networks. So they actually look physically different when you start mapping this stuff out. But for me, when we think about, you know, the, the stuff that we're talking about, you know, F news, um, actually what worries me are visuals, memes, the, the circulation of old content, Photoshopped content. You know, the challenges here that we have to get, you know, a handle on this when we have closed messaging apps, we have people who are doing this with very sophisticated methods. I mean, again, I'm in my bedroom with a pillow over my head. <laughs> can anybody make me feel better? I mean, Anya, can you talk about Facebook? I mean, when you think about these things, everybody's talking about text articles, mm -hmm. clickbait headlines. I mean, how is Facebook thinking about the visual element of this? Yeah, like where we've started is the worst of the worst false news, like the bottom of the barrel. And we're like, I really think Facebook could afford two euros. <laughs> 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 Just make a mistake no. and put it into I'm, my. I'm going to have to put in like my uh, 
Metro card. I don't recognize. <laughs> twenty dollars on it. All right. Oh, Forties. All right. Dollars. You twenty dollars Metro card. Okay. I'll take it. Um, <laughs> okay. So. They won't take that the bar. By the way. No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, where, where we have started has been the, just the worst of the worst and really trying to understand that. And I would say, like, this is still early into that particular program that, that we've shown you this morning with third party fact checking organisations. It's a new program. We are trying to understand what the roadmap looks like. And to that end, you know, that question about videos and memes and, and that whole array of content that now, all of us are so familiar with in previous lives and storyful user-generated content and how that can be used for propaganda purposes and, and being manipulated and, and photoshopped. I would say like that, that those are things we have to get to. We're just still early to understand how is what we're doing right now around text and these spoof domains. Um, but we're learning. And the one thing I would say as well is that we're not going to figure this out on our own. And to that end... There's been a concerted effort on our part the last couple of months. We've been doing hackathons. We did one in London last week where some of this was coming up. We've done one in New York. We've been doing a series of roundtables, workshops, work streams, etc., to really try and understand it. And I would just say we are listening and taking the feedback back into our product teams. Okay. I might have taken a pillow off my head. Alexios. <laughs> no, I just mentioned that it is. Uh, uh, there is an onus on... on I'll speak for the organizations. I know for fact checkers to, to go where users are, and that means not just Facebook, right? So there is an organization called Asia Vacia in Colombia um, that has done uh, fact checking on the classic form and now has launched, and you can see that on Neiman Lab too. Uh, and I hate uh, advertising a competitor. So, um, but they. It's about collaboration. It is all about collaboration. Um, but they, uh, they are asking their users to send them. Uh, a false-looking content from their WhatsApps, and they will fact-check them from their closed groups that you, they wouldn't otherwise have access to, on one condition, that they, if you send it and, uh, and the CFSCA tells you that it's false, then you, user, have to send it back to all the WhatsApp groups fact-checked um, that you were in. So, you know, thinking about this cleverly, it won't be hits, it won't be traffic, but it'll be trust and um, uh, attachment from your readers and your users. Yeah, and another example, actually, I was just in, um, in Asia, and this amazing guy came from Thailand, and he has a fact-checking organization, and he uses Line, which is very popular, and basically he has thousands and thousands of Thai people who send him messages online saying, is it true that silicon gel packs will give me cancer? And he does a YouTube video, and he pushes it back online, like on the messaging <laughs> app Line. Um, so when you start looking globally at what's happening, mm -hmm. there's some really interesting, innovative responses, particularly about messaging apps, and I do think we need to look at that. Yeah, so there, there was a project in Burma where they, they used, um, well, they're, they're setting up in Burma, it was actually in, I forget which country in Africa, where they, they just used SMS, which is obviously uh, for people who are using you know, 2G phones and, and so-called dumb phones, that's the most powerful way to get it. And they, they actually had people in these communities where uh, tri there was violence because of rumors that had been spreading, false rumors. So they set up and they hired people locally to collect the rumors and they also set up SMS and phone messaging systems and they would broadcast out to people, you know, here's what we know about this rumor and they would also invite them to submit them. So I, th I think there are some really creative solutions. For us, we, I have a video producer starting on my team in about two and a half weeks and what we realize is, you know, we'll write a, a debunking post, but that's not necessarily the best way to deal with it. You know, a uh, X hundred, hundred, hundred word article for something that is essentially a, a, you know, a visual representation of something is probably not the best way to get it out there. And so we're, we're going to be doing really visual oriented debunking, whether it's um, images and memes uh, and also videos, really short videos, 15 second videos, 30 second videos to see what, what can we do to make this stuff spread as much as the false stuff? Um, how do we come up with creative methods? So I think that's, it's just a wonderful challenge to think about. And, and more people should take that on from more disciplines, not just journalists. And I think that's why this is not just an economic or technology challenge. It's also a cultural change for journalism. Because it used to be that you derived your authority from your byline or from your title. Now, for a journalist, uh, you derive your authority from your engagement and how people regard you. One of the great revelations I had as a TV anchor was when I first went on Twitter and suddenly I was talking to people who may think I was shit, but you know, by engaging with them and asking them questions, I realized there was a wisdom in the crowd. If I collaborated with them, it would make me a better journalist and suddenly my relationship with these people was based on openness and trust and transparency and I ended up creating a business on that fundamental pr principle. And I think what we learned from, and we've learned from the work of Craig and 
Alexios and, and all the other fact checkers of the world is, collaboration is the core skill for the journalist in this post-truth era. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that's respected. You should have to put a euro in for post truth. Yeah. I oh, just want to say that. <laughs> that's 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 Sorry, a bingo card you can't phrase set the rules right there. Yeah, who okay. has got the bingo card? Alex <laughs> Reed. Yeah, yeah. He's playing bingo. We have a metro card. <laughs> No, I was just going to say, like, Dan Gilmore from Arizona State University, he's probably in the audience here somewhere, who um, is one of uh, the industry experts when it comes to news literacy and thinking about empowering the community and users and the public. And he always makes the point that the news industry has probably sometimes been over-obsessed with the idea of the supply of content and hasn't thought enough about demand. And if we were to try and stabilise those two things, what does demand look for? looked like and how do we create that demand and that's something we've been giving a lot of thought to in in Facebook and you know with news literacy project um, we have we're working on some public service announcements um, and the idea being take an expert like news literacy project how can we give our community the users the public skills and tips and tricks some of the tips and tricks that journalists use when when you're suspicious of content and what are the workflows you go through so how can we give some of those skills and information to the community so I would say watch that this space on that but the other thing that I'm really struck by and haven't gone to so many conferences is that right now from the user perspective we struggle I think to define the problem and it is complex and so like for for our part with this consortium news integrity initiative the question is can we fund applied research that will help us better understand what the community what the users need from journalists and and newsrooms and publishers and then in in terms of of paying back can we take that applied research and the recommendations from the community and fund projects and innovative ideas that are ultimately going to uh, respond to the demand of the community? And that's just an important point, is to think about the demand for journalism as opposed to always the supply of content. Great. I'm very aware that um, this always happens. The panellists get going just as I was like, I'm going to do Q&A. So who's got a microphone and wants to say something? Do you have a microphone, lovely lady? Here is a man with a microphone. <laughs> Hi, my name is, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, my name is Maria sadowska Komlech. I'm from Dutch organization Free Press Unlimited. I have a question. We're at Journalism Festival here, so could I just grab your attention back to journalism and ask each of the panelists to say, what is the main thing in the quality that journalism has failed in that brought to all this fertile ground for fake news, and what is the main thing that the journalists and editors should do in the next years to return this trust if we set aside all the technological solutions? Okay, great question. Thank you. Um, Craig? Oh, man, you always go to me first. Um, so what have we failed in? I, I do think uh, a couple things come to mind. First, uh, on that overall decline in trust that we're seeing, um, and, and the numbers I'm seeing are more uh, North America-based, so I'll, I'll say my, my bias on that. I don't know if it's as extreme in Europe. But I think we failed to realize that there was a growing separation between um, how journalists perceive ourselves and how we perceive our work and how we're actually perceived by the public. Uh, and, and so I think failing to recognize that, uh, that yes, there's an overall institutional trust decline, but realizing that it was happening to us, I think we maybe were a bit deluded about it. Uh, and so that, that created a big separation. Uh, so that's, that's the, a failure that comes to mind. In terms of fixing it, uh, I, you know, I, I think that it also goes to the business model challenge, which is that a lot of places kind of just went for scale and went for traffic, and they're starting to realize, you know, thanks in, in part to the decline of CPMs on programmatic advertising, that, you know, there's really not a sustainable business model in that. And so I do think that the, the solutions are tied to more sustainable business models that attack that separation that's happened where we figure out how we actually can be closer and more valued to uh, by people because I think that that building that closer connection and and helping people you know choose us at, select us and go to us again is going to create that trust that enables the more quality information to flow so in some ways I think some of the solution is like there's attack the misinformation directly but also think about this fundamental separation that has been created and how do we close that gap again yeah I think it's the economy stupid um, I think if you are a journalist and you're basing your work um, on a business model that essentially says journalism will depend on its ability to reach in shallow ways lots and lots of everybody. If that's your model, there's no trust in journalism. 
the trust in journalism is built on the quality of your direct in engagement with individuals to make them feel that you have your back. And so therefore, unless that business model changes and we all start to understand about developing a personalized journalism, what I've been calling you know, the first wave of the democratization of the internet we talked about, here comes everybody. Well now, for journalism, it's here comes somebody. How do I personalize and individualize my journalism as an organization or as a, a person who has a beat to the needs of the individual? And for us as innovators, how do we build an economy based on things like direct payments as opposed to advertising? Uh, and I think that the act of journalism will change if our business model is no longer about shallow engagement with everybody, it's deep connection with somebody. Fundamentally, there's two things at play here. Number one, that business model problem. And I have to say, two, from the platforms, it is algorithms that don't have trust and objectivity. So those two things are fundamental. Everything else, I think we can make progress on. They're the two things I worry most about. Other questions? George Brock. He has a very tall hand. Can I do this no, you can't. You have to do it with a microphone. Because we're live streaming. Excuse me, George Brock from, among other places, City University of London. I want you to imagine a miner in Philadelphia reading Facebook feed and seeing something, let's say, about climate change. He's been told by Trump and company that climate change is not just untrue, it's a conspiracy directed at him. He sees the little flag come up on the new Facebook system, which tells him that Snopes doesn't think much of the thing he's been reading. He thinks, yeah, right, and posts, because as far as he's concerned, that's a recommendation. The reason I'm making this point is that you are focused, excellent discussion, thank you, very eloquent, very expert, on the producer side, the journalists. This is a consumer issue. This is the demand side you've got to think about. This is about what people recognize as truth in a democratic system. And I don't want to depress you, but we're, I would... We're already depressed, George. Okay. <laughs> I would suggest you settle in for a very long haul. Because doing that is inevitably an iterative process that takes a long time. I look forward to it happening. I'm not really worried about the repair of journalism and the repairing the... I think we've got lots of great energy, great organizations. You've described some of them. The bigger issue, it seems to me, is what people recognize as truth. Now, when, when truth, the monopoly of truth got broken in the Enlightenment, the monopoly held by monarchs and the church... It took a century or so of everything from inventing libel laws to public service broadcasting, etc., 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 to decide what people could agree about in democracy, which, please let's not forget, is a battle of ideas. People have to fight it, and they fight it with information. So the rules about what's okay and what's not take a long time to work out. And if I were Facebook, I'd want to take lots of advice from journalists, but I'd hire a few political philosophers if I were you. <laughs> Um, I don't think there was actually a question, but it was a great no, it comment. Wasn't. No, 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 no. <laughs> white men are very good at that. Alistair Reid, another white man. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want to be offensive, George. But <laughs> Any women who want to ask questions? I'm a yeah. big fan of that. Oh, great, a woman with a microphone. Thank you, Claire. Amelia Persic, Media University Institute, London. Um, um, there are already studies which actually show that journalism has moved a lot to, towards political centers of power. On practical level, if I understood well, that means that media covered a lot Trump during the election campaign, but what was he saying? Not really what his polit policies, and primarily what the people, the citizens, the, the, the users of the media think, feel. That's one kind of the studies. The other kind of the studies uh, talks about homophily and how people gather around those on social media who think the same. Do you think particularly, Mark, because you are a journalist, but everyone else uh, on the planet, do you think that this is one of the problems too close to, if we talk about <laughs> White House before Trump, if someone from White House at press conference approached a journalist, yes, Mark, it was like I've made it in journalism. I'm with White House on first name. 
Do you think that's the problem, that journalism has moved from the original roots, providing, you know, being a watchdog, providing the information to too close to, and then people run to the social media where they can express themselves? Yeah, it's, it's the reason I you know, left journalism on a daily basis. You know, I, I used to be a wireless correspondent, so I remember the, the glory of having that wireless press pass, and you got in, you got into that small little sanctity, the room, and it's where Kennedy gave his press conferences and the fireside chats of FDR, and you felt you were so close to it, and it was great. And of course, that's a dangerous mentality to have as a journalist. But I actually don't think it's about closeness to power. Because in the end of the day, Donald Trump said this most eloquently, if that's not a contradiction in terms, um, he just bypasses the media. He's got 100 million followers collectively on social media. He bypasses the power of the media. And I think in some ways, part, you could argue chicken and egg, I, I don't know which, but the point is the rise of social media has allowed, and I saw this with Obama my, when I covered his campaign, he could bypass when he had a problem the traditional media and go directly to the people. And Trump's entire political success is on that basis. So it's undermining the relationship that used to be there. The bigger problem for journalism is we cover politics like a horse race. Who's up, who's down? It's amoral. There's no value in it, you know, because ultimately we're focused on kind of predicting how this will, ha what will happen, and we've ignored the fundamental underlying, you know, economic issues, problems for ordinary individuals. And I think that's my problem with journalism right now. It's a detachment from the concept of public utility and more for a kind of a form of like entertainment based on sport. I have friends in journalism who talk about elections being their World Cups. That's to me much more dangerous than that, you know, heady feeling you went, you got when you got your White House press pass. But I just, one thing I say is there is incredible 30 years of academic research about the problems with horse race journalism and we haven't changed a flipping thing and the research exists about how problematic it is. And I don't know. I, it, yeah, I'm, I'm back in my um, bed. Alistair. <laughs> oh, you need a microphone. Yeah, you Oh, you can come next. <laughs> Hi. Um, so another woman asking a question. Hurrah. Um, Diane Kemp from Birmingham City University. Um, I wanted to kind of move you on from what you were just saying there, because one of the issues uh, in the session yesterday talking about populism and how journalists, you know, we missed it, it's something to do with the lack of diversity amongst journalists. Oh, you know, yes. we're so subject to groupthink. <clears throat> you know, it's an issue that then makes us not see these things that crop up that actually, if you uh, take a bus ride and you hear people talking, they've noticed. You know, we're missing out on that stuff. And um, I, I just, you know, I'd love to hear what people think we ought to do about it because thinking about your solutions-focused journalism, there's a lot of discussion about it. I think it is going to move forward because we haven't got an option. What we're currently doing is missing the point and we're becoming, you know, anachronisms. Yeah, I mean, if you listen to um, Hannah Nicole Jones, she's been on the circuit for the last four months saying, she's got this great quote about the lack of diversity in newsrooms and then she takes away the caption and says, this is from the 1960s. Newsrooms in America are less diverse now than they were in the 1960s. Um, and so if we don't actually realise that, and actually Stacey Marie Ishmael tweeted about all this money that's now flowing, like the, you know, Pierre Emidia announcement, like, there's now more money going to investigative journalism. She's like, w when are we going to actually invest in different types of newsrooms and not give more money? No offence, white men, I love you. But there is a real issue here about when we look at newsrooms, they're way too white. The male too men, and, and in the US context, they're from the East Coast. So there's, and it's the same globally. It's, it's class, it's location, it's religious affiliation, it's a whole host of things. Um, but I do feel like we've been talking, again, at journalism conferences for a long time, and until we look at structural issues around internships that are free, and so only if you've got an, you know, an uncle who lives in a major city can you do that internship, there's a whole host of, oh, a lady with a drawing. It's, it's really helpful to be resourced journalists now, that journalism is about getting more inclusive in the news. Great. I love questions that are also an attempt to sell <laughs> something. <laughs> Very clever. <laughs> Okay, so I'm aware of time, so I have said Alistair two times, so I'm going to let Alistair, as Thank a you, previous Claire. first draft staff <laughs> member. Uh, yeah. Hi everyone, Alistair Reed from Press Association. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about, uh, that following on from George's point um, and the previous one about Trump as well, the issue around uh, 
previously when people told lies, there would be negative social repercussions. You know, you would, people would trust them less, people wouldn't socialize with them. And online, that has kind of been taken away and slightly replaced by when people lie, there are some positive reinforcements, whether that's a heart or a literal thumbs up or whatever platform it might be. How are those, how, is there any way to counteract that without breaking down part of the, the core parts of the platforms? Or is there anything that journalists and news organizations can do from the outside with that positive or negative repercussions for truth and lies in a social context? To everyone, really, anyone. I, I wonder whether that is really uh, a task for journalists, and I'm not trying to chicken out of this, uh, or a task for schools. Um, so, uh, and here's my plug. Um, for uh, International Fact Checking Day, we had a lesson plan that has reached tens of thousands of students, and a big part of it was readers first do no harm and understanding that that like, that uh, um, share, uh, that uh, heart is actually impacting your fellow audience and what they consume. And so to me, it seems first and foremost, uh, hey, do you realize that it's, you know, it's not just the heart, it's actually pushing uh, shitty content up? Uh, and because you're a friend of whoever is going to see it in their newsfeed or on uh, their Twitter, um, that, that's going to that's gonna be, they're going to be more likely to believe it. So I do think most of the time I really am focused on journalist side, on company side. Uh, I hate, really I hate to offload it on user side. But in this case, I think if there is some space for education. I, I hope I didn't like weasel my way out of that question. One big good thing we've learned from Facebook is that people will trust individuals and they don't really think about brands anymore. So the studies I've seen internally from Facebook and also externally are that most people don't remember the name of the brand from where they got the news. They, they just remember the feeling of trust they feel from the person who shared it with them. So for journalists and organizations employ them, let's stop thinking about whether or not the New York Times or The Guardian fact checks something, but whether it was Alexios or Craig or anyone. And that direct relationship between the individual, I hate to use the phrase journalistic brand, and the person, I think, is something we've learned from uh, news on Facebook. Last question is nice man at the front. Hi, my name is Valentino. I'm a freelance journalist, so I'm very concerned. So I want to move from the political philosophy question to a political economy question. So I guess that uh, producing uh, false or fake news, it's much easier, much faster than producing good journalism, right? Yeah, to make investigations, it much, takes much longer than to, to produce like uh, the bullshit you are talking about. So uh, fake news generate ad revenues, yeah? Two dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just have a hundred oh, years. <laughs> <laughs> I can repeat fake news for uh, my, uh, my, my entire life, okay. okay. <laughs> um, so uh, then um, uh, false news generate ad revenues at the highest, a faster rate, yes, than quality journalism. So I guess that um, uh, incorporating the principle of uh, news trust into an algorithm and uh, um, un uh, un unbundling the financial incentives and the news on Facebook. Maybe it go, it's going to get, generate some cost for Facebook in terms of loss of other revenues. Uh, this is the first question. And if uh, Facebook is, is uh, ready to take up uh, this, uh, this cost. Yeah, I, as I said at the start, uh, our research has shown that a lot of false news is economically motivated. And that has been a key starting point for us to ensure that people are not making money from false news on Facebook. Categorically, there is no place for it. And as I mentioned at the start, we've taken a lot of measures to early detection around those spoof domains and, and cut off the connection between traffic on Facebook and linking out to these spammy websites. So we want to end that, and we've taken huge strides already. And then, as I said as well at the start, any false content that uh, has been flagged and disputed gets downranked, and you cannot uh, push it through as an ad. You cannot promote it. So you cannot put uh, financial revenues against it. Yeah, you're, you're, going to, you're going to lose other revenues then? Yes. Well, and I would, and I would say... I, I would I would say it's like tiny uh, what what revenue was being made to be totally truthful about it but I would be categorical we do not want false news on our platform and therefore we do not want any of the financial ties to it either yeah the, the purely false stuff it's a it's a drop in the bucket compared to if for example the hyperpartisan stuff 
it's a, the revenue earned from that is much, much smaller. The, the arguably the bigger problem in some ways is to going to the political points being made is the, the economic motive for p spreading and creating political misinformation, not 100% false stuff, but like misleading and, you know, the really over the top headlines. That's a much bigger problem. And it's also much harder for the platforms to police because there are legitimate free speech issues there. You have websites that will publish some stuff that has like the text of the article is actually pretty accurate, but the headline is completely over the top insane. And, uh, and if you try to restrain that, there, people are going to scream about free speech. Again, it's a legitimate issue. Uh, and so that's actually a harder problem and a bigger economic money, money maker, which is, which is why, frankly, I think we have this, this growing polarization. It's because there hasn't been a better economic time to, po to polarize people and to do misleading political misinformation. It's extremely, it's much more profitable now than it's ever been. And so, yes, we've always had these, these war of ideas in democracy, but right now you can earn money by pushing a certain idea and by being more misleading. And that, that to me has been something that's just emerged in the last two years. And it's a, it's a much bigger problem for platforms and ad networks. Okay, so we have to wrap up. Can you just put the last slide up? Because are Jonathan and Liliana in the room? So they have created this guide. We're having a fight about the title, obviously. Um, <laughs> but they have done amazing work mapping the misinformation ecosystem in France and Germany. And they've built a field guide for journalists who want to report on this. And they actually have an event tomorrow at 4 o'clock, Sala Priori. Go. It's going to be amazing. Um, thank you for your attention. Uh, we, we, there's lots of competition. And so thank you to the panelists. Did you really enjoy it? I did, yeah. Thank you. against those who would use it against its democratic purpose. So we would see in the early days of the Arab Spring, for example, where we would see a video of a apparently Syrian soldier being buried alive, but in fact it was a propaganda hoax perpetrated by the Syrian regime to try and reflect badly on the rebels. How do we find out? We had open collaborative groups of fact checkers that came together uh, who, who basically could verify and in this case debunk. The problem what I've seen over the past 10 years is that the forces of good in this battle for clean information have been aped in some ways, mimicked. That the things that we used, the techniques and the processes, the social web itself, which is the best fact-checking mechanism ever known to man, has been turned on its head. And now these dark forces hiding in plain sight are using the collaborative instincts of the social web to spread hate. Just look at the rise of the Twitter bots that are spreading misinformation and hashtags right now in the French elections and the presidential election in the US last year. So in many ways, what we've seen is the search for truth, the battle against misinformation. The tools we were using in the early days, let's say, of the Arab Spring have now been weaponized and turned against us by these forces of darkness that are hiding in plain sight on the social web. And it has to be said, while we talk about Twitter, we talk about the messaging apps, we have had the rise of a news feed from Facebook that is in many ways about passive consumption. And I don't think that we can start this conversation or go through it today without pointing to the fact that I don't care if you call Facebook a technology company or a media company. It, I could care less. But this is probably the most dominant form of news distribution in history, given the amount of people that rely on Facebook for news. So we have to examine very closely the criteria if we have this dominant news distribution system that does not have, as a core of its algorithm, truth or objectivity, that is a fundamental problem and that makes it different than what's come before. If it's just news spreading ambiently, programmed by an algorithm, then we have a problem of dimensions that have not been known before. Now, I know that, that lots being done by Facebook, and we'll hear from you later on about this. The final thing I would say before I hand over is that this is all to do, as I said, with the supply of misinformation, but also the demand. We're living through a, an implosion of trust, not just in journalism, but in the public institutions of our society, because people just don't believe anymore what they are reading. They have, I think, in many ways reacted to an information overload of historic proportions by just retreating back into what social psychologists call the heuristics. You know those shortcuts that your brain uses when faced with misinformation or too little information sometimes, your confirmation biases. Which means when we check facts, sometimes not only do people not believe us, 
but they believe us less the more we bludgeon them with the truth as we see it. So information overload is fry those neural circuits that we need to process information. And just as we need trusted sources of information, journalism is living on top of a business model that is bankrupt, that penalizes trusted sources of information by forcing us as journalists into a pipeline of information in which there is no distinction between the shit and the quality, that it's all priced for the same programmatic ad model. If you were to invent a model to erode trust in journalism, you could not invent a better model than that, the business model that we've been forced to live with over the past year. So I think one of the things I would leave you with, and, and this I think hopefully tallies with the rallying call we have, is that walk away from here. Don't just tick a box and say, yeah, I've, I've got my, uh, my fake news. Uh, Phil, sorry. <laughs> I've had my fill of that um, <laughs> particular topic. Everything you will hear over the next two or three days in some way comes back to this challenge of restoring trust in journalism. Whether you go to a panel on solution journalism or data journalism or any video panel, this is all about us as journalists finding ways to get back inside the heads of people whose brains are fried by misinformation and too much information. So this is something far broader than simply that moral panic that Claire talked about. And I, and I hope we see it through that perspective and that lens, uh, both an historic lens um, and also solutions that are about solving problems that we've never had before. Thank you. Excellent. Oh, clap mid-panel. <laughs> so Craig Silverman's got some slides. This first slide is the worst design slide ever, and it includes... It's very simple. It's a simple <laughs> slide. Um, okay, so it's just a simple slide. I don't know what she's dogging about it, you know. Also, get your two euros out. All right. Uh, well, I'm going to now not read my slide. We can start solving it. So I've got an incredible panel, and I'm going to ask each of them to speak for about five minutes about their particular work that they're doing in this area. Then I'm going to throw out a few questions, and I'm going to throw it out to you. Um, but I'm going to start with Mark uh, Little, who I worked with back in my storyful days, who just wrote a great piece in Neiman Lab, if you have or Neiman Reports, about building a new trust economy. Um, so I'm going to ask Mark to talk a little bit about how far we've seen these things come in the last few years. Thank you, Claire. And listen, that's a great introduction. We may have approved a declaration out of this after all. Um, I think one of the things to say what this is and what this is not, and we've just taken the term and we've dumped it in the bin and that's great, but the second thing we need to do, I think, is say it's not just about truth or alternative facts. It's about trust as well. This is not, as we talk about the misinformation ecosystem, about the supply of misinformation. It's also about the demand for misinformation. And those two things are so important because it then leads you to put to bed another, I think, exaggeration which is that misinformation has always been with us. That is quite true. It's absolutely self-evident that back in the days when Gutenberg was inventing the print printing press, we thought this would be, or I'm sure he thought this would be, the opening of a democratic era of full information when in fact it became the, the prelude to the most violent period in human history. More information does not necessarily create trust. And I think what we've seen over the past 10 years, for me, is what makes this so different to what came before. What makes it different from the tipping points in the way TV and radio have been used for propaganda, for hate, I think back to the way that Hitler used television and radio to sow hate, the way radio was used back in Rwanda in the 90s to incite genocide. What's different now is the collapse of the means of production of news as we understand it. So the rise of social platforms when we start looking at the creation of Storyful was the transfer of the means of production of news from those who had printing presses and transmitters and satellite dishes to anybody who had a device and access to a social platform. And the means of distribution of news also were lost by journalists. There was a vacuum and a void, and what filled it, to a large extent, was misinformation. So we mentioned Storyful. The idea was a group of us got together and said, what would happen if we tried to fill the vacuum that has resulted from this historic shift in the means of production? What would happen if we tried to verify this user-generated content or eyewitness media and fight back? Well, uh, many of us are friends for transparency. I worked with Mark and Anya at Storyful. Uh, Anya and I also sometimes share a, an apartment in New York. Uh, Greg and I were founding partners of First Draft. 
Uh, I shared a three-hour train ride with Alexios, and he's a good friend. So uh, it's a joy to be on this panel with people who I talk about this stuff all the time with, uh, and to have a conversation with all of you about these topics. So we're going to talk a bit, and we're obviously going to have a Q&A, because I'm sure lots of you have lots of things to say about it. The second reason why this is going to be the best panel ever on this topic um, is because it's a kind of a call to action. We've gone through four months of a moral panic, this crisis mode where we're looking at these short-term solutions and thinking that if we all sit on panels, we're going to solve the problem. But we're sure as hell not going to. And the first thing we need to say is we need to stop using the term fake news. <laughs> to the point, can somebody hold up the bowl? <laughs> this is the fake news tip jar. I've already said it about four times. I've got another two. Thank you. It's also my personal Aperol Spritz fund. Uh, but we just need to stop saying it. So this is Google Trends um, from Korea. This is not just a Trump exercise. A big part of this uh, panel is to say this is a global phenomenon. We need to stop thinking about this through just a simple Trump lens or a Macedonian teenager lens. This is much more significant. It's much more systematic. And I've just come back off a three-week trip to Asia where politicians around the globe are using the term in the same way as Trump is using it. And we need to stop doing it. People stop using the term global warming and change to climate change. We need to come up with that. Part of the reason for this panel is also we need to come up with that <laughs> this new term. Um, we've got some ideas. We might share them a bit later. Um, so, uh, th yeah, this was recently in Korea, and I asked them to say, well, how are people, you know, thinking about this term? And they have terms globally for these things. So, um, to get back to this point, it's gone. I pitched this to Chris in October. We're not allowed to use it anymore. <laughs> and the thing I'd say to all of you is, and the reason that I think this panel is important, is that we are all part of this problem. So this was a great keynote by Randall Rothenberg, who's the president of IAB, back in January. And he said, it's much more than a supply chain failure. It represents a moral failure as well, one that implicates marketers, agencies, publishers, platforms, and technology companies alike. So one thing I would say to all of you when you leave this room is what role are you going to play in fighting this global information pollution crisis? It either means that you start a group in your local community where you teach verification skills. It might mean that you work for a platform company and you give data so that we can research these issues. It might be that you're incredibly rich and you want to fund First Draft. <laughs> Whatever it is, I want you to leave this room and do it because we need to stop flipping just talking about it and wake up to the fact that this is a global crisis. This has been happening and building for years. One thing that Trump did was put a spotlight on it and made people open their checkbooks, but this actually has to be something that we need to think seriously about. So many of you may have seen this slide floating around, which is my attempt to say, if we're going to stop using the term, we need to understand the whole ecosystem. So Craig and I, you know, on First Draft, Craig did great job, a great job basically talking about News, which was this idea of 100% for-profit designed specifically to deceive. And he was talking about this for the last two years, did great work at the Tau Center, but then it's been co-opted. And so the point of this slide is to say we are all implicated in this. If we are writing clickbait headlines, that's part of the mess. If we're retweeting old coverage, old photos, if we are actually calling out the wrong perpetrator of an attack, we are part of all of this. And if we don't recognize we're all part of it and keep blaming Macedonian teenagers, we're not going to get any further in terms of solving it. And so part of it is thinking of the different types, but part of it is thinking about the motivations. In Asia, the motivation isn't profit. The motivation is inflaming nationalistic divisions. It's about religious divisions. It's about freedom of speech, suppression. There's a whole host of reasons people are doing it. And if we don't understand the nuance and we don't understand the platforms, if you spend time in Asia and you understand the different messaging apps in all of the different countries and the fact that this isn't necessarily just about the Facebook news feed, it's about dark social and how do we stop this if it's circulating in WhatsApp groups and Kakao Talk and Line and Viber, then we're not going to get any further either. So this is nuanced, it's complex, it's going to take us years to get out of this mess. The solution is not going to be glamorous and it's not going to be quick and it's not going to be solved with one big check. We need to dig down and recognize... Right, Alexios. Sorry, just very excited about this one. <laughs> um, this is my rallying cry. Uh, it's going to take us time to dig out of it, but we have to realize the seriousness of this uh, before.